Hello and welcome to this edition of the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lav. Well, if you're wondering what it looks like when Scotty Scheffler puts it all together, wonder no more. The world number one shot a bogey-free 66 in the final round at Bay Hill, won the Arnold Palmer Invitational by five shots, his first win in 51 weeks. That obviously sets him up nicely, not just for his title defense next week at the Players' Championship, but the rest of the major season with the Masters now just one month away. Rex, you were there. You are still there, sipping a yingling, no doubt. What did it look like? What did it sound like? What did it feel like as Scotty rolls to his seventh PGA Tour victory? I just realized I made a huge tactical error setting up. So uh, the, the actual media center is just in the next room over. And as we've done this before, you don't want to bother the other guys who are on deadline. So I, I came into where the, the lunchroom and apparently there's pizza and beer behind me. So that we're, we're, it's going to be a high traffic area. I just realized this is the one place that I probably shouldn't have set up. It, it was fun. It was fun to watch him, as you said, put it all together. It was fun to kind of write the story because he sort of hinted on it earlier in the week, just about the idea that I'm going to figure this out because I've decided I'm not going to be perfect. I'm not even going to try to be perfect. And he kind of expanded on that a little bit tonight when I asked him about it. And along the way, along these 12 months, and it is interesting that you just said his first victory since the Players' Championship. He won the Hero. And granted, it's a small field. It's in the Bahamas. First official victory, I should say. It is his first official victory. So I do think you need to say that. But this is, you're right, what it looks. I thought... Shane Lowry, who he played with today at Bay Hill, said it best. He goes, he showed us why he's world number one. Rory McIlroy just marveled. He goes, when we all know how good of a ball striker he is. We all know what he can do if you put a golf club in his hand. All he needed to do was figure it out and just put average. Like, I think we've had this conversation before. It's not like he needed to go out there and be Brad Faxon. He didn't need to go out there and be the world's best putter. Just put average. And today, he was much, much better than average. And he wins by five. So I think he gained four and a half strokes on the field and won by five. I don't think those numbers are mutually ex exclusive. Uh, I, I agree with you. And we now have a large enough sample size that when to know that when Scotty Scheffler puts great, not when he puts average, when he puts great, there is no beating him. And in fact, he's probably going to win uh, in a route as he did on Sunday. This is the fourth time since the beginning of 2022 that Scotty Scheffler for the week has gained more than four shots on the field on the greens. His results in those four events, Rex, win, 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 win. I mean, the guy is absolutely lights out. I did think this was kind of surprising just because of what we'd seen from him so far this season. And by you know, by all accounts, it has been a, a pretty solid season. His worst finish uh, was a T-17, uh, still had a boatload of, of top 10 finishes in the early returns here. But his last tournament was at the Genesis Invitational, where once again, he was first in the field in strokes gained T degree and last in the field in putting. You talked to him throughout the course of the week. What's the turnaround? Is this just kind of a one-week aberration, or is the strides that he's been making with Phil Kenyon once they started working together after the Tour Championship last fall kind of starting to pay dividends? I think it's a combination of a couple of different things. I don't want to discredit the work he's doing with Phil Kenyon. I think it's been very, very good. I think the switch to a mallet-headed putter, he started with a new putter. This week. Thank you, it's, Rory. It's Thank you, Rory. Actually, he was asked about that, and he sort of laughed it off. And he, he pointed out that they had been talking about it internally, Randy Smith, Phil Kenyon, for a long time before Rory brought it up. But it he was, was testing. He was testing him last summer. But it was you're right. Like That was what Rory said last uh, in Two weeks ago. last start at the Genesis. But, yeah. man. You know, you know th thankfully, put, Scotty's not using a mallet because it wow. actually gives us a, a chance once he puts them out of the bag, wins by five, it blows away Rory. Shot a, he beat him by 10 shots. Uh, uh, yes. Had a chance to win on Sunday, which was very interesting. So I think those two things certainly factor into this. This has been a long process. We have talked about this for pretty much a year now, right? I mean, we, we know how good of a ball striker he is, and the putting just hasn't been there. And it's not as though it hasn't been great. It's been bad. Like, I went through all of those events since last year, since the Players' Championship, since that victory. And, I mean, he's just not losing 0.5 strokes. He's losing four and a half strokes. He's losing seven strokes in one tournament. Like, he's, it was bad, bad putting. And so, I think this is an indication more, though, than anything he's doing physically, than anything he's doing equipment-wise. I think it was just a mental adjustment that we know, Scotty, like, he's a thoughtful guy. And I think he finally wrapped his mind around the idea that he can't get caught up in the outcome. And this is going to sound like the cliche that the sports cliches always are. 
but he needed to let go of the outcome, and he did that Thursday, and I think that was a key for him. He said he went out and shot 70, felt like he left so many shots out there, but then he and Teddy were standing on the range after the round, and they looked at each other, and they're like, man, I felt like I actually putted pretty well. And I think that's the key when it comes to putting. If you're just not, if you're not one of those Brad Faxons, if you weren't born touched by the hand of God to be able to just hit the putts, if you're not Jordan Spieth, if, if you don't have that gene, I think you need to wrap your mind around the, uh, around the idea that if I hit a good putt, if I hit the line I was trying to hit and it had the speed that I wanted to and it just doesn't go in, there's nothing I can do about it. I just need to move on to the next hole. For the perfectionist that is the PGA Tour player, that's really, really hard to do. And I just think he did a better job of that this week. Yeah, so here's a little bit, Rex, of a peek behind the curtain. I sat down with Sky Scheffler for about 20 minutes on Saturday after his third round at Riviera, uh, trying to, to do some reporting for a Sky Scheffler Players' Championship preview piece. The premise of the story was not going to be, as, as you have surmised, a, an obit to Scotty Scheffler or, or burying him uh, for what has been his misfortune and misgivings on the green. In fact, it was it was more glowing than that. It was it was basically his reflections on the past year, what at this time was a 51 week winless drought, and kind of the bugaboo. There was a couple premises to the piece that unfortunately will probably now never see the light of day on NBCSports.com slash golf. One is that. There has not been much in Scotty's athletic career that has ever befuddled him from junior golf to other sports to college. He has always figured out stuff, which is why the putting predicament that he's found himself in has been so maddening to him. As you say, kind of this pursuit of perfection. Well, throughout throughout the, the history of Scotty Scheffler's golfing life, it's been pretty close to perfection. This is a player who won almost 75% of his junior starts. Uh, over a decade span, he was a former U.S. junior champion. He was a three-time uh, high school state champion. In college, he nearly won an NCAA championship. He was picked for the Walker Cup team. He won a couple of times. He got through uh, sort of the, the injuries and the issues that he had with his back in college. Like, he has always, always, always come out the other side. And so that's why this has been such a test mentally for him, to have the right perspective, to have the right patience, the, the right levels of patience, because – Quite frankly, this was something that he was unaccustomed to. The, the thing with Scotty that I found most interesting is that he he really doesn't understand or or kind of – well, he definitely acknowledges that the fact that as world number one, he has to get nitpicked. You know, he's, he's, un, he's under a microscope. What he doesn't like and what he kind of framed differently is if you, if you watch – he said he, during the fall when he had some downtime, he watched – some of Tiger's old clips when Tiger was winning golf tournaments. And he said people were ripping Tiger's ass, his words, not mine, ripping Tiger's ass Whoa. on the coverage if he ever missed a 15-foot putt because you just sort of uh, – you, you just assumed he was going to make You just assumed that a, a player of, of his prodigious talent was going to make that putt. And Sky says, I've kind of entered that tor- that territory with, with golf commentators. Where if they show me, you, you know, uh, lining up a 15-foot putt, and I and they and they preface it by saying, you know, this is the area of the game that Scotty Scheffler really struggles with, and then he misses it. It's sort of self perpetuating, and so that's kind of what he's been dogged by uh, over these past fifty two weeks, and probably a little bit longer a, as well. The fact that he's he's being nitpicked and asked constantly about the thing that he does worst in golf. No one's asking about his ball striking. No one's asking about the fact that he is on par, basically, with Tiger's peak seasons in terms of his long game. It's always constantly the one thing you don't do well. And that can really that can really affect a player mentally. I mean, we wouldn't want to hear that constantly every single day of like, no. I mean, you're 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 a great reporter, Rex, but you're writing, you're kind of sucks. Well, Lavender, you can really write, but on TV, you're dreadful. Both of those two things <laughs> can be true, but to hear them over and over again, uh is it, certainly kind of where where the feelings got rubbed a little bit raw for Scotty Scheffler. And, and I can see that frustration. And I think we have seen bits and pieces of that over the year. And look, I think there's something to be said for there is an ebb and flow to his seasons that are pretty easy to track, right? He always seems to play pretty well 
at the Waste Management. He always seems to play pretty well here, where he's won twice now at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Seems to play pretty well at the Players' Championship, where, as you pointed out, he's a defending champion. It's those West Coast venues that have Poe Greens, which, look, they're confusing. It's not Scotty Scheffler's problem. This is a golf problem. It's really, really hard to putt on those greens. And then as we get further, further north, I'm not talking about Augusta. I'm talking about the venues where you're dealing exclusively with bent greens, and it's a little bit different than what he grew up putting. I think it's a comfort level. Like I, I feel like he's pretty comfortable on Bermuda greens. I feel like he's pretty comfortable on the bent greens that are out in Scottsdale because those are pretty basic, pretty easy to deal with. And he certainly has something for Augusta. So I think there is an ebb and flow to this that explains at least part of it. But I like I went back just and looked at his ever since he joined the PGA Tour every year that he played a full schedule. Just once has he ranked inside the top 100 and putted. I don't think he's ever been a great putter and I don't think he's ever going to be a good putter. I think he still has a chance to being the world number one for a really, really long time because he hits the ball that well. It almost felt, Rex, like I was being trolled. <laughs> I, I mean, Scotty Scheffler made each <laughs> of his last 23 putts inside 15 feet. A couple of weeks ago, that would have seemed unfathomable. A couple of months ago, that would have seemed uncon- inconceivable. Last summer, remember Muirfield Village? He gained like 23 shots on the field with, with his ball striking and lost like nine on the greens. Like We'd never seen that great of a disparity. You never would have seen Scotty Scheffler make 23 consecutive putts. He was 15 for 15, 15 today from 15 feet, from inside 15 feet. He made a 34-footer. Like All the things he had to do today... He did. He looked like the guy that you would expect. Oh, yeah, that's the world number one because he does everything really, really well. And I, I kind of used the perfect line, you know, he not trying to get away from being perfect because you would look at today's round, at least statistically, from the outside looking in, and you can make an argument, man, that, that was a perfect round. No the worst, bogeys. Part, worst part was his, was his approach play. Yeah, yeah. I mean, which, which is, is crazy. Uh, I mean, the closest he probably came to a bogey was on 17, and everything was in the bag by then. He had a plug line, just hit this beautiful shot to, to pretty much tap in range. So it looked like a perfect round from the outside. So I just love sort of the machinations of what's going on inside his head. He looks so calm on the outside, and he looks so put together and at peace with himself. But it, I think he gave a little bit of a glimpse. You said you hadn't read the transcript yet, but you, you probably should because I think he did kind of open up a little bit on what had the last year – has been like he's heard everything he knows better than we do exactly where his shortcomings on he said he focused on it in the offseason whether or not that's going to pay off long term i think we still need to give it some time but i think today was a big first step i didn't cover tiger's prime in the early 2000s or even that 05 to 07 period Uh, i was just beginning my career when rory was going on his assault uh, in in 2012 and 2014 but listening to scotty's peers it's very interesting to hear how they talk about Scotty's play of how like, wow, we all know he's at another level ball striking wise. And if he could just make some more putts, like he's going to do some things that are very, very, very difficult for us to catch. Like you can, you can hear the level of respect for a man of his immense talent and how I think everyone, certainly his peers <laughs> are kind of dreading that or they're, they're, I guess they're hoping that this was a one week aberration or they're dreading the fact that, hey, maybe he's actually made some strides on the green. You look at his stats this week. He was first tee to green. He was first around the green. I think that's one of the things that's kind of overlooked about Scotty Scheffler. He's a big man with very soft hands who can play a ton of, of really nifty, creative shots around the green. He certainly did that at Bay Hill. He was fifth in putting, but he was 12th in approach play. I don't have the stats in front of me. I, I have a hard time believing that this was not actually his worst iron performance in months if not longer, I mean, Scotty's never 12th in the field. And so it was just an absolutely clinical performance. uh, And I'm very curious to see how he follows it up this week (laughs) at TBC Sawgrass. And and I can say, like, I mean, we all watched with with great interest today because Sunday was going to be the day that if there were any shortcomings in – on the greens, it was going to be glaring today. Like that, that's the day we put the microscope down. And if you miss the five footer, then everyone's going to say, yep, there it is. We, we knew it was coming. I don't think there was a putt today th- that I saw him getting ready to hit that I was like, yep, he's not making this one. Like, I, I just felt like there was a confidence. There was an air about him. And it's not as though he had been putting great all week. He hadn't been giving strokes away is essentially what he had been doing today. Just felt like everything came together. One player for whom it did not even though he did have a chance, was the world number two, the, actually, the guy who's actually closest to overtaking Scotty Scheffler in the world rankings, however you still feel 
about the world rankings, but Rory actually needed a little bit of a rally on the back nine just to close with 76, just to finish in a tie for 21st. He hit only 40 of 72 greens, which was almost last in the field in approach play. When we did the preview podcast, Rex, on Wednesday, we, we kind of prefaced it by saying, hey, you know, we're willing to give Rory a little bit of grace here. He doesn't typically play well on the West Coast. He almost had the doubleheader in Dubai to start the year. But if he does not play well at Bay Hill, that's when you can kind of sound the alarms a little bit, which is two uh, uh, tournament starts remaining until, at least for him, the year's first major. Where are you now on the Rory uh, stress meter I found it interesting that he talked about his driving. He was second in the field, strokes gain, tee to green, just behind Scotty Scheffler. So he has a lot of confidence there. And he almost had a bit of a chip on his shoulder when he said, let me guess, I led the field again uh, off the tee. Well, he didn't, but he was really, really close because he knows how well he's driving the ball. And normally when Rory's driving the ball, well, everything else flows. Like everything else falls in behind his driver. I think it was more his iron play. And he seems to have a case of, of a lot of pulls with his irons and he, he he talked about the idea that he's got three days going into next week's players championship to figure it out the good news is tpc sawgrass is a really really tough driving test and he feels like he can pick up a lot of strokes there it's not like it's all that easy on approaches though either he's going to have to hit much better iron shots i, I do think it was interesting we talked a lot about rory's putting as well he actually putted pretty well this week i mean not as well as scotty did certainly on sunday but Again, he is the guy when he is. He was working flight. really hard with Fax after the opening round, for sure. I think whatever happened Thursday night between he and Fax, and Roy got into that a little bit, talking about how his right shoulder tends to ride up, and he ends up hitting putts almost thin, which I found fascinating because I, I hit every putt thin. I just thought that's the way you were supposed to do it. <laughs> but watching, and I actually talked to, to Brad about, about it a little bit, about exactly what they're working on, and and he has his tendencies. That's the interesting part. I mean, Rory is a very, very smart guy. I don't think I need, that's not news to anyone. He's very thoughtful. He spends a lot of time talking, thinking about things in the world as well as his golf game. And it seems to me, he keeps coming back to that one thing when it comes to his putting, but it, it you never, you very rarely see that where a guy is, is putting in the dark at Bay Hill on Thursday night and comes out Friday morning firing and has a good round. I, that every time I see that, I'm thinking, yeah, that he's done. Like, you don't figure it out overnight. And he did that, which gives me a little bit of hope going into next week. But he's got to figure out his iron play. It's it's bad right now. Yeah, and I think that's actually quite concerning as we look ahead uh, to both TBC Sawgrass and Augusta National. Rory is ranked 133rd this season on tour in approach play. You mentioned the, the left miss. I think that, that reared its head over and over again this week on the sixth hole, the par five, where he's trying to hit kind of a long to mid iron. He played the par five hole and four over for the week just could not help the left miss we saw it doom him a couple times uh, overseas as well it's just a real bugaboo for him and as we know and as we've seen over the past decade there is no greater indicator of success at augusta national than iron play the days of it being a putting contest are over it's not just a driving contest anymore he can he can be center of the fairway on every single hole but if he cannot capitalize and hit it to the right shelf at Augusta National, he's really going to struggle. That has to be a major point of emphasis, not just next week and getting ready for the Golf's fifth major, uh, but Augusta National and the Masters as well. I think it's so funny you're also, seeing the traffic behind me of all the yeah. – all, yeah, see them all? Who, get, the hooligans just, yeah. just sucking down their yanglings and stuffing their faces with some greasy pizza. I did also, Rex, want to touch on something that, that created a little bit of stir as it relates to Rory with this idea that the PJ Tour should be more cutthroat. And Wyndham Clark followed up again on Saturday saying he agrees with Roy's premise that the PGA Tour should essentially just be the best of the best, call it 100 guys, whatever the number is. It basically, just make it not more of a closed shop, but make it kind of an aspirational circuit for the best of the best. This did not go over well at all on social media saying, don't you remember where you came from? These are the stories that we want. We want more promotion. We want more relegation. Where did you fall on this, and were you surprised by some of the blowback that both of these players received as it, as it pertains to what seems like a pretty logical idea? Uh, very surprised with Wyndham Clark, the blowback he got. I was actually talking with a, a tour official this afternoon. 
afternoon about it because I think 100, and maybe that's not the right number. Someone mentioned, I was actually asked Lucas Glover about it after his round on Sunday, and he felt like 125 is probably a better number just because that's been the number historically. And in his argument was that mm. these fields should be 125. That's a different conversation. I actually think Wyndham had thought this through, and I understand where he was coming from. I think the blowback came from the idea that someone posted that he was outside the top 100, what, 18 months ago, right before he won the Wells Fargo? And I think the idea – that the argument was, oh, well, you wouldn't be in that magical number. Well, that's not necessarily true. Like Wyndham Clark is clearly a good player. We know that now. I mean, he, he was about to become, he was about to win his third signature event this week if, if Scotty Scheffler doesn't Scotty Scheffler. So uh, we all know he's talented. I think eventually he would have played his way on. I, I don't understand the pushback because I would say the other side of the coin is anyone who wants this week will tell you 69 is not the right number. And that's what we had this week. And there was a cut and it didn't feel right. And it, it just feels empty. My argument to this is, and I've seen it, and I go back to Doral. That this was before your time. I mean, but, this is essentially just a WGC event. Which and is, Doral, it's, this, it's is, this is what Doral went through. There was the Ford Championship. And one year you had Tiger and Phil going head to head. They very, very re rarely did that during the peak of their careers on Sunday. And it was just a madhouse. And Eddie Carboni was the tournament director. And he turned it into something really, really special. It had local flair. It was an event. And it was a full field event. And then it became a WGC. And it was a limited field, I think 70 players. And Championship Management, which is the tour biz side of the business that runs the WGCs, they came in and made it sterile and made it not as good. And you feel it in the gallery. You feel it walking around the grounds. And I think that has a lot to do with, first, foremost, the fact that there's only 69 players here. Like, I, I think that has something to do with the vibe of a tournament. Is I don't know what the right number is. I keep going back to, we can all agree, Augusta National seems to have figured it out. More times than not, they put on a really, really good show, and they're somewhere between 90 and 100 players every year. So I feel like the number's somewhere in there. I just know that 70 doesn't seem like it's it. 70 doesn't feel like it's it. Uh, I also had a little bit of an issue with, with the cut. You know, b before, I liked the idea of a cut in these signature events just to have some sort of urgency, something to pay attention to on friday but when it, i mean for a time it looked like just three or four players were going to be missing out it ended up being 11 players who were either not inside the top 50 in ties or not within uh, the 10 shot rule which the tour has implemented for these uh kind of legacy events or player hosted invitationals i think the fix around that rex is to not have a cut but but have a cutoff in terms of who's receiving fedex cup points the, the cut doesn't necessarily have to be monetary keep them around for four days but i think I think one of the big issues was the fact that if you finished last place in a no-cut event and you were still receiving FedEx Cup points, you're you're essentially reducing the the likelihood that there's going to be that churn. I think they wanted like 35% churn uh, or 65% retention rate for the players who get in the signature the events. And if you were still handing out FedEx Cup points for finishing 60th right in a signature event, that's kind of de defeating the purpose. I think that's where you can kind of draw the line. It, it just seems very weird, maybe even a little bit cruel to 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 get rid of less than a dozen players and and make them have have the, the commitment that they have to play in this tournament to to kick them out when it's going to be less than a dozen players. Well, and to go back to your question, I, I did not understand what where, where Rory was coming from I mean, with the cutthroat comments and the smaller fields, and I, I get it. Like I have come around from the other side of it in the tour, this tour, whatever this version of the tour is going to be going forward. It has to be about the stars. It has to be about the product. I just feel like this version of that isn't the best product. And I don't think getting getting shorter fields, smaller fields is the answer. So I'm not quite sure where Rory was coming from on that one, because I think time and time we've learned time and time again. East Lake is not a very exciting event more times than not because you've only got 30 guys there. I'll go back to Doral. You can keep going to where the tour has made smaller and smaller fields, and it doesn't equal to more entertaining or better fields. Yeah, I'm, so I actually like what the PJ Tour has done this year with the full field events and the signature events. I think this swing five and the next 10 that the tour has implemented this year, I actually think it's a pretty good idea, and I actually think it's worked uh, reasonably well. I don't have the data to, to see exactly how many players have come in and out, but it does at least – open the uh, kind of extend the possibility that a, that a Jake Knapp who won the Mexico open followed up with a good week uh, at the Cognizant could then come here in Bay Hill. He didn't have, he kind of had a forgettable for performance here, but let's say he parlays that to something else. And all of a sudden what he uh, did on six snowball. on Saturday was forgettable to you. 
the rest of his week outside of the 12 that he made, yes, uh, in the third round on the sixth hole was, was forgettable. But but that sort of story is is still allowed to flourish on the PJ Tour, which I think is a good thing. And, and look, there was a lot of quibbling on social media. I follow a lot of, uh, you know, very inside golfy folks. But I but I guarantee if you ask kind of a wider swath of, of, of golf fan or sports fan, they would probably agree with Rory that it does need to be more cutthroat, that it does need to be just the stars only, that there is probably a little bit too much fluff. You, there's definitely some fat that can be trimmed, but the inside golf folks don't want to hear that. But I think the larger sports fan in general agrees with the premise that there are way too many guys who have been who have been grifting and, and freeloading on the PGA Tour for too long. Absolutely. And that was the one thing that Rory said that I totally agree with. When you look at the priority list, which is how the how the PGA Tour essentially makes up their fields. And it starts with the major winners and goes all the way down to past champions is the last category. And there's guys hanging on in the past champions category that either haven't played in a decade or shouldn't have played in a decade. And yes, there's plenty of those categories the tour should and can just start lopping off. I think that was Rory's point, that the tour is set up to allow these players who are 10 years past their prime just to hold on until they can make it to the champion store. It's time, unfortunately, for those players, for them to, to, to sort of just rotate out. I love the idea, if it is Wyndham Clark's idea, but of 100 players, 20 in, 20 out at the end of every year. I think that's the churn that you're looking for. That That's exactly what I would like to have. A 20% turnover is pretty good because that does give your next class, whether that's the next Wyndham Clark or Scotty Scheffler, whatever the case may be, an opportunity to play their way up. And it also gives the guys who aren't there anymore. And someone pointed out that, well, Justin Thomas would have been right on the edge last year playing his way off the tour if it was top 100. And my response was, yeah. I mean, play better. Play yeah, better. Play better, man. Like Billy Horschel would have played his way off the tour. Okay. Sorry. A, a more cutthroat product, I think, permeates through the entire PJ Tour ecosystem at every single level. Because the 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 intensity is going to be at the top for those guys trying to get paid, but also at the bottom of Justin Thomas trying to save his season. If you have actually severe and indisputable relegation and promotion, not this thing where, well, you can lose your card, but you can still get in through conditional status and you can still get sponsor exemptions and you're still carving out a 20 event schedule. That's what I'm not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an actual class delineation of going from the A tour to the B tour. No, no in between. And so I think I think that creating a more cutthroat product at the top, I think just makes every other level that much better to try and get inside that top tour eventually. I see where he's coming from. Maybe the execution wasn't great. Maybe it wasn't able to be fleshed out enough on social media. I was a little bit surprised by the backlash. I actually think that is the direction that the PJ Tour needs to go. Well, Rex and one of those person that one of those people that was pushing back, and this was the conversation I had with the tour official, was the Monday Q guy. And Ryan's, you and I both know Ryan. We worked with Ryan. I, I, I think he does a fantastic job. My point to that was, well, because this is impacting exactly what Ryan does. Like he covers the Corn Ferry Tour, he covers the Monday qualifiers, and so it's going to impact the players he has. So I understand where he's coming from, but I don't disagree with it. I think eventually, if we get to where the if this magical international tour that Rory continues to, to sort of outline for the world. If we ever get there, 190 players, that seems about right. And you do that for 15 or 20 events, and you have your turnover, and you and you pick up next season, and you do it all over again. It works in other sports. There's no reason it wouldn't work in golf. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lab. You guys know the drill, nbcsports.com slash golf for all the rest of your golf needs. We'll talk to you guys in a couple days when the Players' Championship gets underway.